Hello, hello, hello. Uh, we will be getting the we will be beginning the finalist uh, <clears throat> competition uh, in mere moments. Uh, I am up here to announce the teams that have made it to the finals. Yeah, um, they have already been announced on Discord, but just want to make sure that everyone uh, in person and tuning in on the stream uh, are aware whether or not they are presenting. Uh, so uh, we have team, the following team numbers that have made it to the finals. We have number team number two, team number 424, number 47, 51, 46, 420, uh, 0, 28, 41, and 42. And they are being presented in that order. And so uh, when you are next to present, you can uh, queue up uh, just over there. And we will be beginning with team number two shortly. Thank you. I uh, just want to want to clarify both team 424 and 421 have made it to the finals. Sorry for the <laughs> the jump scare there. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, we are team EcoTrack. My name is Nikolai. This is Hassan and this is uh, Nanjen and um, here's our two minute video. All right, we're Team EcoTrack, and we are presenting a bio-wearable device for cattle on grazing behavior research. Livestock farming, essential to global agriculture, supports 1.3 billion people and accounts for 40% agricultural value. Yet, it's also responsible for around 2% of greenhouse gas emissions and endangers grassland prairies. Researchers and ranchers are in need of more data to detect health issues early, improve farm efficiency, and save endangered grasslands. The problem providers face two major problems when collecting data for their grazing research. A lack of customizability in purpose-built devices and reliability issues due to the remote nature and lack of power on grazing sites. These issues have hindered effective cattle management and environmental conservation efforts. Our group leverages artificial intelligence of things technology to design an autonomous data collection device for remote sites. The device is powered by solar panels and intelligently collects data and transmits it over the cell network to the cloud while conserving energy. As solar energy is limited, the agent has to intelligently decide between collecting and transmitting data. We avoided complex hard-coded strategies and instead trained a reinforcement learning agent to maximize its power levels, while also maximizing the frequency of collected data. At regular intervals, the agent has to decide whether to collect data into the outbound message queue or to transmit data. There is a trade-off since the problem provider requires up-to-date information but also does not want gaps in data collection. We trained an agent in simulations and were able to train an agent that can learn a strategy to maintain higher power levels while transmitting less frequently at night. Our prototype device comes in a small form factor and is small enough to tag along on a cow's ear. The first prototype uses Wi-Fi for data transmission with a code base that is modular and ready to support a cellular microcontroller to be swapped in later. The data is stored in the cloud and is readily available for review to the problem provider. All right, so now for our presentation. So, um, percent agricultural value. Yeah, it's also responsible for around 2% of greenhouse gas emissions and endangers grassland. Yeah, so one of the main challenges that the problem provider faced was that the devices that they were using to collect information were static IoT devices. So that means their code base is fixed and they once they're deployed, they cannot dynamically adjust to new situations. Uh, the devices are powered by solar power, so at night there is no power generation and during the day there is an overabundance of power potentially. So we propose to use AI to learn a strategy that will maximize and dynamically adjust between um, data collection and data transmission. And we propose to do that using uh, reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, the agent takes an action that has an effect on the environment. Based on that action, it then um, 
changes the state of the environment, but it also takes a reward base or a punishment depending on the outcome. In our case, the reinforcement learning agent is our prototype, and it can select from one of three actions. It can sleep, which uses the least amount of power, but also incurs a penalty because it does not collect any data. It can also collect data and save it in the outbound message queue to transmit later, or it can collect and send data, which uh, allows it to take all the rewards, but also has a very high power cost. In addition to that, if the agent ever runs out of power, it incurs a very, um, very large penalty because we want to force it to learn to conserve power. We were able to show that in over hundreds of days, the agent learns to maximize its own reward. That means that it can outperform the baseline, which is just a simple uh, collect and send strategy. Uh, it can outperform it by about, by about 25% because it um, to collects uh, messages and then stores them and sends them later. All right. As for the live demo, as promised, the device uploads the sensor reading data to the cloud, and then it's easy for the problem provider to visualize it all in one dashboard. We have the current GPS functionality turned off just because we don't get GPS signal in this room, but as we turn the device, you can see the accelerometer portion of the IMU on the TV, it'll change the accelerometer axes as we turn it and rotate it, and it also updates the battery. Did it change? Yeah, there. Okay, there. Okay, so now we already have a viable machine learning strategy and a working prototype. So for next step, we will collect long-term data and keep improving the machine learning model and then try to develop a more powerful prototype for the actual deployment for actual kettles. Thank you. And we will take questions from our judges. Hi, uh, my question is, uh, how are you going to make money? What is the revenue model and the business model for your product? Uh, there is an estimated, I'm gonna, 1.5-ish million cows in Alberta, and uh, a lot of them are actually out on remote grasslands. So a device like this could potentially uh, keep the farmers tra keep track of their um, cattle. So the revenue model would probably be just um, a single purchase and also an ongoing subscription. And have you, because you have trained it for over 100 days, do you have some validation data about uh, talk to some farmers to find out over these 100 days if anybody is interested in this? Uh, well, oh, sorry, this is uh, hundred simulated days. So it was hundreds of uh, days in simulations. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Members of the Naloxone Auto Injector team. Over the past few days, we've developed a device that could potentially help combat the opioids crisis. But before I get into that, let's first understand what naloxone even is. With the emergence of synthetic opioids such as the commonly known fentanyl, there has been a sharp increase in opioid-related deaths due to their increased potency. Naloxone is a life-saving medication that rapidly reverses the effects of an opioid overdose and kits can be found for free at most pharmacies in Canada. So this may beg the question, if there's already a solution in place, why should we care? Well, despite naloxone kits being released to the public in 2016, in 2021 there was over 80,000 opioid-related deaths in America, and this number has been consistently increasing since 1999. So does this mean kits aren't being used? Is the process too complex for people to use them? To address these questions, we created a time-adjustable device that is able to automatically inject one dose of naloxone to a person that is overdosed on opioids. So how does it even work? 
Upon turning on the device, a 30 second timer begins counting down. If the user taps the touch sensor in the outside of the device, increments of 15 seconds are added to the timer until the user taps the sensor again, causing the countdown to resume. Once the timer reaches zero, the pre-filled syringe will inject and administer a dose of naloxone to the user. While this is just the prototype, the final product would be a wearable armband with a more compact version of this device attached. Thank you for listening and taking the time to see our vision in creating a user-friendly solution to save the life of even just one person directly affected by opioids. Um, well, we're the team for the naloxone auto-injector. My name is Carolyn. My name is Bishan. My name is Koinsala. And I'm David Bria. My name is Andres. Okay, um, I guess I'll do it in a different order. Uh, right here is the prototype. Uh, we have we have an Arduino connected to a OLED display. When I turn it on, the OLED display starts a timer of 30 seconds. It is incrementing down one second at a time. Uh, right here, we have two servo motors. Uh, what they do is one of them injects the syringe into the person, and then the other one injects the plunger down. Uh, they had to be adjusted in terms of how far they would be going, and they, after that, they pull them back up. It will work in about three seconds. So that was the initial injection. The second is putting the plunger in, and then third, it pulls the injection out. So as you can see, it's pretty quick. I put delays into the actual uh, uh, different steps because it needs some time for the uh, naloxone to go into the person. And also, the other part of this is for a person, if they decide that I need more than 30 seconds before I am incapacitated, like I know I'm going to need more than that, then they can tap here and what it'll do is it'll increment 15 second uh, additional timing until they decide, okay, that amount of time is good. Um, so why are we even automating this process if these kits are available for free at pharmacies? So a lot of times people who use opioids, they are using it alone just because of the stigma around opioids use. So if you're using it alone, typically the effects of opioid overdose leaves you too incapacitated to be able to administer naloxone to yourself with all the steps that are taken with the kit how it currently is. So automating it allows it so if the user does go unconscious, a dose of naloxone will still, still be administered to the person. Also, taking it from a different perspective of the person actually administering naloxone to someone, what can happen is that this is a high stress situation, especially if you don't have a trained medical experience. So being able to simplify it and make it hassle free really helps in that sense. And then also with the kits, some addicts will misuse the kits and just take the syringes for their own recreational use. Okay, so for our future plans, um, for the market product, we plan on making it more compact so it fits on an armband. There are equipment available and we plan on using that. Then also we plan on making it wireless so that as soon as the injection goes in, a signal should be sent to 911 to contact an ambulance. We also plan for the device to have a sensor that would record the heart, heart rate or the breathing rate of a person so that automatically it detects when a person is overdosing so it can, so it, the person doesn't have to press a button so the whole system is automated. Yes, and thank you. Thank you. So thank you for the, just wanted to note that uh, you're using American data, is that correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there is a lot of data that can, available in Alberta, that can actually tell you how many people are having an 
opioid overdose in this actual zip code on in real life every single day, updated every 24 hours. So yeah, using local data and, and understanding the Canadian problem would have been uh, a good idea uh, rather than the American problem. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the presentation. I really appreciated it. Well thought out, interesting concept. And I just kind of had a question about um, have you, well, actually, you'd really taken a lot of it into account. Um, and I did, though, have a question about what is, do you know what, if any, is the risk of being injected with naloxone if you are not <laughs> taking opioids? Okay, so um, a problem provider, uh, we asked. So uh, we asked our problem provider that exact thing, like, is there a risk if a person just takes it? And he said, there is no risk. Uh, just the injection itself, when going in, causes pain. So that's the only issue. Hi. Um, really nice presentation. Um, just wanted to know one thing, that this is an automated machine, right? Yeah. Okay, so how you're going to measure the force when, force of the needle when it's going into my skin? I um, mean, how, how do you measure that when you are designing that? Uh, so right now, we kind of did it based on what we had available. We used servo motors, mm -hmm. and we were able to give different angles, right, uh, of how much it should move. Mm -hmm. We didn't really have a chance to look at exactly how much force it was giving. We didn't have the equipment to measure that. But in a future version where uh, we could do more testing, we could go measuring that and make sure that is uh, the right amount. Mm -hmm. Also, it always goes the exact same distance. So that, uh, we'd always do about uh, half, an inch. half an inch. So it doesn't uh, go very far into the muscle. But that half inch would be half an inch may be different for me than different for somebody else because of my body weight, my muscle thickness and everything, considering all the facts, right? Yeah, so typically uh, when you're injecting naloxone, it really only needs to go in half an inch, even if it's different um, body types, as it's better if it goes deeper into the muscle because then it can activate quicker, but if it even it's just uh, injected subcutaneously, so just under the skin, it'll still be able to take effect. It just may take a bit longer. So did you calculate the time when you were injecting it, like how much time it needs actually going to the muscle and then release the drug into the muscle? So did you that, measure the time? So that's what I was talking about, is I put delays in between the steps. Uh -huh. uh, there was going in, like injecting the syringe into the person, uh -huh. then a two, one to two second delay there, then doing the actual plunging of the uh, liquid, and then a one second, and then it's going back okay. up, and it goes really quickly. With the syringes that the naloxone kit provides, mm -hmm. they actually have the ability, so when it goes all the way down, it actually pulls the uh, needle up by itself, the syringe itself right now. Mm -hmm. um, we are not doing that way, uh, just because of the way we have set it up to like tie it together, but, uh, with a different syringe, mm -hmm. uh, we could do it that way as well, for pulling the needle up. OK, thank you. Do we have time for one more question? OK, uh, my quick question. Um, because if you, th uh, Michael talked about uh, Canada, and if you're talking about naloxone, this is, uh, it's a problem where our system is a public health care system. So I'm very curious if you have given any thought to who your customer is and how you're going to sell and commercialize this. So there's a few different ways we could uh, approach this. One way is the customer, because naloxone kits are provided for free. So uh, we could approach this as uh, Alberta Health Services as our customer and because, they, uh, because this availability is uh, sorry, this product is automated. It would make it more uh, effective in an individual person kind of case. So they'd probably be interested in investing in this kind of product. Another option is doing it like um, when you have glucose monitors, like 
uh, it's on a 14 day cycle where you, buy, you uh, the person who is actually using, uh, checking their glucose gets to, uh, has to buy it and they do it through insurance as well. So that's an option as well. Okay, so this is a medical device type two because it's injecting into your body. Uh, it would require clinical trials, uh, so that would require you to be working with a doctor or somebody. So have you had any consideration or talks with your uh, problem provider about that? Um, um, or since it's in a typical naloxone kit, each dose is 0.4 milligrams per milliliter, and then we want to just do one dose because in an naloxone kit you do three doses of a smaller concentration. So we need to work with doctors to be able to see what, 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 what's the highest concentration that we can give that's going to be able to reverse the effects of opioids but not cause any additional harms to the person if we inject at a higher concentration in just one dose. Okay, thank you. Hello, we are BCI Music and this is BCI Beats. BCI Beats is an interactive music creation app for children with motor impairments. For these children, the ability to create art or play music is immensely valuable, but often inaccessible. Therefore, we created a, an app for them to generate music from sound clips in a fun and interesting way. When you open the app, you are greeted by the main menu. Before composing music, you need to calibrate the app to your brainwaves, then you can make selections between various instruments and melodies. These can be combined into countless unique compositions for endless fun. Diving into the specifics, each screen has an array of flashing buttons, and to make a selection, all you have to do is focus on the button that you want to pick. The app works by reading the EEG signals through an open BCI headset. Behind the scenes, an LDA-based classifier interprets P300 evoked potentials in your brainwaves, turning what you are looking at into a choice made on the screen. Our front end was made in Unity with handcrafted, child-friendly graphics. This provides a colorful and enjoyable experience while using the app. While many music apps are geared towards advanced users and have dull interfaces, we focused on producing an accessible and engaging experience for the kids who use the app. Through our partnership with AHS, we hope to deploy our app in hospitals around the province. Ultimately, our goal is to enable everyone to explore their passion for music. Okay, awesome. Um, so now that we've done our video, uh, we'd like to just jump right into our live presentation here. Um, so as the video said, uh, to use our app, we start with the training phase uh, to calibrate our model, and Kai will speak a little bit more about that. Here we see Caden is going through the training phase. So first we will see one of these spheres will be highlighted for him and he is going to be focusing on this sphere. And now we're gonna see all of them light up. And so at this point, we're reading in his brain waves and this data is gonna be used to train the model. Now for demonstration purposes, we're only running through one uh, training run, but in a real life scenario, we would have more training and incorporate offline data as well to have more accurate predictions. Okay, awesome. So now that training is done, we're on the Choose Your Instrument screen. Um, and this screen, we like to have a little bit of audience participation. So uh, if anyone here wants an instrument and they want to be picked, maybe raise your hand. OK, right there in the black shirt. All right, on the screen, on the screen. Instruments on the screen. OK, seeing no other hands. Oh, bass? OK, we'll go with bass. So now we're going to get Caden to focus on the little circle above the base, and that one should be picked. It will now open a screen of the corresponding instrument, so open the bass one. And on the left, you can see test melodies, where you can listen to different sound bites of the bass. And then on the right, you can choose your favorite one to then incorporate into your making your music. And I really like number one, so let's go with that. Okay, so now we can listen to the, the sound clip that we uh, um, chose. Um, so Caden's gonna focus on the play button there. And we're gonna turn the volume up. Is the volume working? Okay. All 
All right, there seems to be no volume on the stream. Okay, maybe let's, let's try a different instrument then. So let's get Kanan to, to change the instrument and we'll um, overlay uh, drums on, onto this uh, 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 music composition here. Okay, so he's gonna focus on the drums. And this screen will be set up similar to the bass, as that you can test the different melodies on the left, and then you can choose your favorite one on the right. But the difference is this is now overlaid on the previous one to combine your music, which you can then hear afterwards. And um, he's going to choose number two. Okay, so let's hope the audio works this time with the drums. Okay, it looks like. Okay, we're we're gonna play from our our speaker here. You can, hear the bass in the back. you can hear the bass in the background from the previous choice that you couldn't hear before, but that was always playing. Just the audio was a bit work, not working. Okay, and uh, that's everything. Okay, I guess I'm going to ask a question. Uh, is this a project or is this a company idea? If it's a business idea, who are you selling to and how will you make money? Sure, so it's a, I'm going to say it's a little bit of both. Um, the idea is that we, our problem provider, uh, Hossein from the Alberta Health Services, uh, he wanted this to be deployed in his hospital. Um, the original idea was not to sell this uh, for profit around, um, you know, across the world, but initially for his hospital, for the kids in his hospital. So that's what we're working on right now, and we hope to deploy that. Eventually, though, um, the way we signed our, our, you know, IP agreement and stuff was that it has the opportunity to expand, and, you know, that can be worked out once we're there. But the initial idea is just to get those kids in that hospital um, with, the, with the ability to use this app. And so everybody's going to be wearing like this headset in order to do that? So they actually have specialized hardware at the hospital. This is what we have to use for the demonstration purposes. But it's a lot more, the ones that the kids have are actually a lot more comfortable and work very well as well. Awesome. Uh, one other thing, actually, just for that last question, just to add on, um, the app is also integratable with all those um, other hardware at the hospital as well, um, if that wasn't uh, clear. Hello again. We will be uh, resuming uh, finalist presentations uh, shortly um, with the first one back being uh, just a video. Um, the team is unavailable uh, for Q&A or the live demo. So we'll uh, just go off their video. Uh, and I believe that will be queued up on the screen. That is the COG log team. Enjoy. Hello, this is Team Coglog presenting Syracode. Our problem statement, there are many conditions which prevent otherwise healthy people from speaking. Speech is an integral part of many people's daily lives, and those who suffer from these conditions are often unable to lead normal lives. The solution we want to provide is to collect brainwave data using BCI hardware. We want to decode the EEG signals into text with machine learning methods. And we want to convert the predicted text back into audible speech to provide a voice for these individuals. The features we want to provide uh, are a simple user interface to record the BCI data, uh, the ability to decode BCI data into text, and the ability to play it back through text-to-speech software. All of this wrapped as a uh, SaaS platform to uh, enable I guess, future, future interfaces. 
So here's an architecture diagram. You can see some technologies we've used, uh, like Vue, uh, as along with uh, Google Cloud Compute Engines uh, and Microsoft Azure Text-to-Speech Services. The BCI decoder pipeline actually runs through both a RNN and a language model. First to split the uh, BCI brainwave data into phonemes, and then the language model can then piece those together into fully fledged sentences. The data set and paper that we based this on uh, is listed here. Uh, worth noting is that through uh, on live prediction, the paper cited 23.8% uh, error rate. So that's pretty good. Future work, we'd like to provide a fully featured uh, BCI decoding SaaS platform. So that includes tools to create new interfaces. So things like maybe wearables or mobile apps that, that leverage the same technology. Uh, and we also want to enable completely natural recording of thoughts. So maybe even for individuals who don't have these issues, but still want to record their thoughts into text. So think live notes or idea journal apps. Uh, we can personalize our use case, uh, so by providing multiple voices to suit each individual, and also real-time decoding. We also want to improve the performance of our model by rewriting the BCI decoder models from scratch with a larger and uh, more diverse data set. So as a quick demo, here we can see our interface. Uh, we la we're lacking the BCI hardware, so we decided to hard code in some BCI data. So these uh, strings here are just representations for, I guess, uh, a subject and them thinking this sentence. So we can select one and we'll send it through the service. The word means it won't boil away easily, nothing else. And we heard the text-to-speech playback. So that was transmitted up to our machine learning model, decoded, turned into text, sent to the text-to-speech, and then streamed back to the browser. So that's it. Thanks. I'm Ahmed with Imagine. MindReader is a system we developed that uses live EEG recordings as well as a deep learning neural network in order to predict what a user might be thinking about. The first part of MindReader we developed was a GUI. The GUI is a tool we use to obtain our in-house training data samples. The program presents a label along with an associated image to the user while their brain activity is recorded using EEG. In total, we were able to capture 500 samples, each being two seconds long. The recordings are then cleaned up using a D-trend and a bandpass filter between 0.5 Hz and 55 Hz. This data is then converted into amplitude frequency representation using wavelets. The data is then fed into a clip which is a neural network provided by OpenAI. The model is able to learn and predict what a user might be thinking about with a test accuracy of 21%, 11% higher than random chance. We use the OpenBCI ganglion, which provides four channel of EEG data at a sample rate of 200 Hertz. We use two probes on the back of the head over the occipital lobe, as well as two more probes over the frontal eye fields. MindReader could be useful for people of limited mobility to express and communicate their wants and needs. It could also be used as an input device to mimic keyboard presses, having potential and recreational activities like video games. In the future, we expect that it's possible to improve accuracy by using more channels and by obtaining more training data samples. We want to thank the organizers the volunteers, the mentors, and the sponsors of NetHacks 2023. Our project is a hackathon project, and you can find more information about it in the description. Thanks for watching. Hello. So we'll begin our presentation. Um, I'm Tony. This is Ahmed. That's Nikhil. That's Arman, and this is Steven. So yeah, as you saw in the video, our general project is converting an EEG signal into an uh, image. During the hackathon, we were able to create a prototype where it converts an EEG signal into a word. Specifically, it's able to guess out of 10 objects what object you're thinking about and with 20% accuracy. So you know that's better than 10%, <laughs> which is randomly guessing. Um, and yeah, so during our hackathon, we came up with a few challenges. First of all, while we're reading the papers on like how EEG signals converted to images, 
Um, we encountered that a lot of the data sets these papers used are using 128 channel EEGs. So just as a reference, this EEG, which is $600 to $700, has four channels. So yeah, you can imagine the price of those EEGs. Not very accessible to like a university student or maybe like a, a less funded lab, right? And so what we did uh, was we created an app that can create our own data set, and we use that. So it creates a, as you saw in the video, actually, um, Ahmed was create, recording some data. It pairs EEG data with an image you're looking at and the word of the image. So like, you know, car or something. And we were able to, during the hackathon, only get 500 samples. That's 50 samples per object, which is extremely small for you know, a machine learning data set. Um, and I'd like to point out that 20% with only 500 samples is pretty incredible, and we expect to have a much higher accuracy when we're able to collect more training data. But yeah, the um, app, the dataset creator app that we created um, is actually very useful um, because, you know, as I said, a lot of university students, they're not having access to these 128 um, electrode EEGs. So now, you know, any university student can open our app and create their own data set with whatever, you know, affordable BCI they have, like this ganglion, and then, you know, create their own machine learning data set. For example, we were able to train 500 samples, or get 500 samples in less than like 45 minutes, right? So that was really good. And yeah, we expect to be able to get thousands to millions um, with this. Maybe not millions. <laughs> um, anyways, so yeah, that's uh, how that data set creator cre you know, fills a need in the market of the research space. Um, I forgot to mention, but our project is in the research stream. Um, and also, our model uh, also fills a market because we're using the BCI Ganglion, which is an affordable model. And most of the models for brain to image are with these e 128 channels, which is you know extremely expensive. But now, you know, once we um, polish this up, you know, some random university students are able to download this model and just put on this BCI headset and you know get whatever image they want, or in this case, object um, with it. So yeah, uh, I think we should move on to the live demo. Uh, yeah, presented by Ahmed. Uh, hello. Hello. Is this mic working? Hello. Okay. Uh, so this is the code that's running right now. Um, right now, uh, my computer is connected to Steven's PC in, uh, in his home. He has a 4090 and it's uh, turning away and uh, computing uh, the EEG signals. Um, so, yeah, so my EEG recordings are being converted into wavelets and in, in, into like frequency. Um, you know, spectrogram, and then it gets, uh, yeah, computed by his side. So this demo um, basically tells me, tells you what I'm thinking about or looking at. So we'll try it now. Um, uh, like we said, it's 20%, so it's o you'll only get it like right one out of five times. So, uh, okay. So something about our model is that it considers like associations between ideas. So as you can see, like airplane and car are usually associated together because they're close to each other in, I guess, like idea space. Yeah, the graph you're looking at is like the probabilities the machine, um, or yeah, similar to the probabilities that the machine thinks uh, Ahmed is thinking about right now. So he's looking at an airplane, and you can see the airplane bar on the very left is quite high. 20% of the time. Uh, any questions? Any questions from the judges? Hi, right, thanks for the presentation. Just a quick, simple question for a few more details. How do you plan on improving the accuracy? Yeah, so we're, hello? Okay, so we're thinking more um, brain, I mean like electrical probes would definitely help. Um, maybe also higher sampling rate and also definitely more training data. We only did 500 samples and that took 20 minutes. Um, and we probably need a lot more than that to get good data. Um, yeah. Who are 
presentation on My Detective. We are Creators 2.0, and we are excited to introduce to our innovative project at NatHacks 2023. Let's explore how our app is setting a new standard in AI-assisted interrogation and emotional analysis. We built My Detective using OpenBCI for EEG data, GPT-4 for intelligent questioning, and a responsive front-end with JavaScript and React. Our back-end relies on TensorFlow and Scikit-Learn for robust emotion and lie detection. We have successfully gathered a substantial data set comprising over 200 distinct data points, culminating in an impressive test accuracy rate of 87%. Which school do you go to? Oh, I go to uh, University of Calgary. We asked the interviewee about the background information during this demonstration and completed the initial form. Go presentation first. Presentation. Now that we have completed the form, we get three questions from OpenAI API based on the information. The interviewer asks one of the questions. We analyze EEG, speech, and facial expression data. The data suggest whether the interviewee is lying or not and his or her emotional state. Based on these data and the response, the OpenAI API generates the next questions. This repeats. In this interview, we ask the interviewee why he hurt his uncle. He lied and said he didn't hurt anyone. We could see the output of our AI model suggested that the interviewee lied with emotion going from neutral to sad. Thank you for watching. Yeah, so yeah, before I start the presentation, I would like to thank all the judges for being here today and congratulations to all the finalists here. Um, so uh, because our time is limited, I'll go very quickly. Uh, we're a bunch of uh, third and fourth year biology, comp sci, and software engineering students. And uh, we came up with this program called My Detective. So what it does is it supports interviewers by analyzing emotional status and validity of interviewees' response. So like whether the interviewee is lying or not. Um, and by providing next questions. So to provide next questions, we are using the ChatGPT API. Um, and the questions will be generated based on all the given data. Uh, like we're analyzing the facial expression of the suspect uh, or interviewee in this case. Uh, we're also transcribing um, the interviewee's uh, response and we're using a language model to analyze all the emotional data from that. And then we're using the EEG data to classify their response into either true or lie. So why my detective? So. Um, it guides the interview processes, so we'll touch on, touch on this later more, but um, of course this is not going to just completely replace all the humans, but it will augment um, the skills and the abilities needed by the interviewers. And um, it can be also used for training by simulating it um, to train all the new interviewers. As well, um, it involves a multidimensional analysis. So as I said before, it is um, analyzing facial expression, also the transcription of the person, and it's also analyzing the EEG data um, to analyze all the emotion and whether, um, to analyze if the person is lying or not. So uh, we'll get into the demo now. Um. Okay, I'll take over the live demo. So I'll play the role as an interviewer, and then Josh here will play as the interviewee. So, so first thing I want to do is to, are we good now? Yeah. So first thing I want to do is to feed uh, GPT, or uh, chat API, um, about the case, about the background of this interviewee, so it understands better about this person and the case, and then give us better suggestions of the um, questions. So I'll just uh, fill, it out, fill it out really quick. Um.
So Isaac basically filled out the profile of this uh, suspect and then the case uh, background and then evidence uh, we have so far. And then we're gonna fill out the history, criminal history about the suspect. I'll just skip that. And then once we submit, it will try to generate the questions. And we can choose one of them um, to ask to the interviewee. And I'll start asking. So what were you doing on the day of the incident? I was home alone. I was just watching TV and I was home alone. And I'll stop remotely and then you will try to retrieve the data and then analyze it. And then we'll just wait just a second. Yep, now we have the emotion data, transcribed data, and then the lie or truth or lie. Uh, using the EEG, and then um, we can see the sequence of the emotion, how it changed from um, from fear to neutral. Um, once we are done, it will be stored automatically in the list in the web. And then now we want to ask more questions. We just have to simply press generate next questions. What we'll do is it will um, have the history of what we have, what we have asked, uh, what, what was the emotion. Uh, uh, from the previous question, and then the uh, the form we filled out, the case, um, case data, and then the person's profile. So I'll just simply press the button, and then we'll try to suggest new questions now. And we'll just choose uh, another one and ask again. So did something unusual happen on that day? Yeah, I woke up late. Um, and then I just decided to cook breakfast and stay home. I never saw the victim that day. And we'll stop. And we'll try to analyze again, and then we'll give it back, uh, give the analyzed data to us, and it will be able to display on the left panel. So, any questions? Is this your own problem, or did the problem get get provided to you? Um, this is our problem. Um, yeah, well, we spent like, yeah, like we spent almost like two days thinking of the idea, like brainstorming. Like we had a lot of headache, but yeah, we came up with this idea, and then like. Yeah, we just didn't sleep, and then we just dived in, and yeah. And have you done, uh, like, what kind of market research have you done to investigate how this could be used? Have you spoken to people in the field, or? Yeah, so, um, yeah, we didn't have enough time to speak to actual people in the field, but uh, we research a lot. Like, for example, like, how many cases are there that um, have, that um, in which the innocent people were actually, like, in prison and those kind of stuff? There were some cases, but it was um, stat like the statistics were not very online, so we couldn't find it. But um, this could be used in very like in many situations. So, for example, in the like very obvious one is a police investigation, obviously. And the second one would be the airport security um, interviews. And the third one would be also um, because this is looking at the emotional data, like facial expression and the speech. Um, we could also use this in the um, the psychological institutes or like those who need help with um, those kind of um, problems. So, um, yeah, and this is very cheap as well um, because like ChatGPT API is like relatively cheap. So it'll cost like around only fifty dollars to generate almost five thousand pages of full of text generated by ChatGPT. So. Yeah, th that kind of stuff were the um, market research that we did. And yeah, there was no alternative like similar to this product. So yeah. Thank you. Um, I think there's a, a potential for using this also in the classroom, particularly when assignments are late and uh, students come up with 
different reasons for why those are late. So I don't know if uh, you have thought about maybe doing a pilot about this in, at the UFA. Can be an easy way. Um, a question uh, about, I think it disconnects. Uh, you mentioned something around how it could be used in, in the police, in the psychological hospitals and things like that. Um, assuming you find your customer, as in whoever, maybe it's the university, maybe whatever, what would be the steps that you will take to pilot this? Because you said there's nothing like this so far in your market research. Okay, yeah, so the first comment about school implementing this, I don't want to get any anti-fans, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll do business to business model first because uh, we're targeting um, the institutions or authorities that will be involved in investigation or interviews. So we'll first maybe um, distribute a small s number of um, samples, uh, programs for these, uh, these institutions or authorities to, to use and we'll get some feedback from them. And then from there, we'll be maybe launching a more bigger uh, market into the bigger market after that. Um, yeah, so that's our, um, that's our initial, that, that, that's the initial step that we would take at the moment. Thank you. So was the question more a comment? <laughs> You're talking about interviewers, uh, I'd say insurance companies. Another thing, uh, some privacy concerns will be there. And uh, just purely from the business point, you know, uh, all business uh, plan competitions, when you say that you don't know that there are any devices on the market, that's grade zero. Because that means you just didn't search good enough. Frankly speaking, existing uh, devices should be pretty close to what you propose, just with some minor variations. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I kind of mis misled um, with my previous response. Yeah, of course, that there are some similar al alternatives. Like, of course, like there's a light detection that uses a physiological responses like sweat. And also, there was some research done on um, analyze, like determining whether a person is lying or not based on EEG. Um, but there was no actual product on the market at the moment. Yeah, but I'm sure that there are some other individuals out there who is trying to develop very similar one at the moment. Um, yeah, but yeah, like uh, like we research a lot, and then yeah, we do have Lack some. Lack of time tests. is a good excuse. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, is this? Yep. Okay. Uh, so my name is Horam. This is Abhishek. We are both a PhD student at the University of Alberta, and we work on reinforcement learning. More specifically, we work on algorithms that can learn very quickly, so in minutes or seconds as opposed to hours, from an online stream of data, so while you're interacting with them. And when we saw this hackathon, we thought about, well, maybe we could try our algorithms on the EEG data stream and see how well they work, so this is what we're going to present right now. So one problem that is very common in EEG data is this problem of high interpersonal variability, which is that if two different peoples look at the same thing, then the EEG signal generated from their brain is very different. So for example, this is me clenching my jaw, and this signal was measured by a mu sensor, and you can see this is how the signal looked. And then I did it again, and this is the second signal. Now, Abhishek, my uh, partner, he did the same thing, and the signal looked drastically different for his case. So if you were to train a single model that would work for every single human, then clearly your model cannot rely on signals that are not common among humans. So it has to rely on the intersection of the common things, which are not that many. And so this is one of the reasons why we see that large models trained on multiple people do not have very high accuracy. So an alternative is that we can train models that are specialized to humans. Now this is not very easy because what would be the naive way of doing it? We could train a model on one specific, the data of every single human, so we can get a data set, label it, train the model, deploy it. That's not very practical. That also has a lot of privacy concerns. So we're going to do something different, which is we're going to learn the model online when we are never going to store any data when we learn the model. So now, Abhishek is going to demonstrate how we would do it. OK, so that's me. And uh, what I'm going to do is, so this is the real-time EEG signals that you see on, up on the screen. And uh, they are in uh, the frequency domain. So it's like a Fourier transform of the actual raw data. And it's for two channels, which are located on my forehead somewhere here, left and right. 
And so if I, let's say, clench my jaw, which you saw a screenshot of earlier, you'll see something there, right? So something very little, something jittery. But now let me do something which is uh, more on like one side versus the other. So let's say like raising my eyebrow. Okay, now look at it again. So I'm raising my eyebrows alternately. Okay, so that's, that's the data stream. And then we are going to train a neural network right now as we speak and try to control this sort of dog to go left and right. So F for the demo. And if the dog does the right thing, we are going to give it a reward, just like how you would train your puppy. If it does the wrong thing, then you say, okay, negative reward, minus one, right? So the red curve that you see on the left, that's the reward. So this is like a positive reward, which goes up negative reward which goes down okay so now let's get to the demo okay so here's here's the puppy okay and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use raise my right eyebrow to make it go right if it does that I will give it a positive reward if it doesn't do it I give it a negative reward okay so let's start didn't do it so negative reward still didn't do it negative reward Okay, positive reward. Good. Good boy. <laughs> okay, so now I think it's sufficiently trained, so I leave it, and now I will just. Okay, so now this is, as you saw, I trained it with maybe 30 seconds of data and now it is sort of reliably doing what I want it to. And now I'm going to show you a model with five minutes of data where we trained it to go left and right. And again, I will leave this here. And okay, so let's make it go clockwise now. And the other direction. And again, the other one. Okay, and uh, so now how it is done is what Kuram will tell you. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, this is like all running real time and this is all learning on this laptop on single CPU. So normally that's not how machine learning models are trained. You need large GPUs, a lot of data and stuff. So the reason it's possible is because this is a new class of neural networks that we at UFA have been working on uh, for a while, for, for many years. They are event driven, so they only do computation when they see something and they learn in real time. Um, and they're all implemented from scratch in C, C++, so very efficient implementation. And then the focus for these algorithms are that we want to be able to learn from few samples, not from hundreds and thousands of samples. And we want to learn from few resources, so we should be able to deploy it on an embedded system. So I have tested this model on a Jetson Nano, and it works perfectly fine, and can learn from image data or similar EEG data. Uh, now, there are more details in our papers if you're interested in reading the more details. So some of the work is not published. It will probably be out in a few months, uh, but some of it is published. Uh, there are some conclusions. Why should we care about this? This is just uh, we're controlling a puppy with our uh, muscle twitches. Well, that's just a demonstration. Clear. There are other usefulness of the system. For example, if we can, if our system can learn to associate any action with any muscle twitch or any uh, gesture, then it has significant uh, implication for improving accessibility. So for example, you can imagine uh, being able to control your cursor with your muscle twitches or your mind if you're not, not able to use your uh, with a mouse. And right now we're using a Muse sensor, which is very limited. So if you had a better sensor and you trained it for much longer, not for five minutes or not for 30 seconds, then you could do more complex things. So you could, for example, in principle, uh, train it to take actions by just thinking about something. Uh, so for example, control the cursor by thinking about making it to move in a direction and turning on, uh, turning on a light by thinking about it. Um, because the learning is happening on device, which means there are no privacy concerns. We don't store data, and it's also very easy to deploy. We just ship the algorithm, and that's it. Um, and that's it. If you have questions, we would love to answer them.
Okay, I can start. Um, uh, what would be, uh, this is a very cool, very cool technology need, I liked it. My question is, who will you sell it to? Who is going to want to buy it? So that's a really good question. There are two potential avenues I, that we see. One is that we can just say we're gonna improve this product a bit more, make a more impressive demo. And then we can get some funding to make products which we can sell to, again, people with disabilities, uh, uh, if who cannot maybe use the mouse cursor, if they can use any gestures, any muscle twitch to control anything that can huge, have huge implication. Then the other option is we can talk to companies that are already working on making this system. So for example, in our university, there is a prof, Patrick Plarsky, their lab is focused on developing algorithms so that people who amputees can, and can learn to control um, cybernetic arms. Uh, so there is already a market which is trying to solve this research problem and we could either sell it to them or we could try to make our own thing. But this is not something that we have decided yet. Just a suggestion, um, find your problem and then train it to make it better rather than going the other way around. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. We will be resuming the last uh, finalist presentations shortly. Um, only four remaining. Uh, we'll start off with a virtual uh, team and then one team joining us from our Calgary site, uh, followed by the last two uh, in person. Um, and I believe we will be playing there uh, video. Okay. Lovely. Yay. Hey, we don't know how much time we have, but uh, we would love to tell you a little bit about the video that you just saw. So the paradigm that we've designed is a truth eliciting paradigm where a user wears an EEG cap and they're presented with various faces. So there's nine suspects that the subject is able to choose between and the subject chooses one and that becomes their accomplice after they could you unfold this yes. after they choose an accomplice they train on the image of their face and while training on the image of their face they become familiar with what that individual looks like so then when they're presented several stimuli of people who they are unfamiliar with and one person who they are familiar with we're able to differentiate their P300 response because the person that they're familiar with will elicit a slightly larger P300 response. And we're able to make a determination like you kind of saw at the end of that fast forwarded video as to who the subject was familiar with. So this could be useful in actual applications. And that's why we're using terms like accomplice and suspects, because if you had a lineup and you needed to determine which person uh, a criminal actually knew, you could essentially use this to determine their guilty knowledge, basically, without them voluntarily giving it to you. Whereas a physiological lie detector can be cheated because you can try and stop yourself from jittering or maybe you don't sweat as much or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't know we were going to present. So our live demo is, gonna, is a bit too far behind. It takes about three minutes to run a full trial. So I don't think we'll be able to get through with that. But we could at least show you what the intro looks like since you couldn't really see that on the fast forwarded bit. You want to explain, Steven? Yes. Um, additionally, due to our lack of preparation, the size of the screen is currently incorrect. Um, <laughs> we're just going to click through it anyway. So as you can see, we are having the computer play Clue as if it were a Clue player. So what it is trying to do, rather than trying to guess what is in my hand by asking me questions, it is trying to guess what is in my brain by interrogating me using a probe and a target, right? So what we are going to do, I'm going to assume the role of this lowly maid serving Lord Dawson in his manner. I want to move up in the world. I'm ready to do things. And one of these things is to commit a murder. Um, myself and my accomplice decide we're going to murder him at an upcoming dinner party. I am going to be the one opening up the safe with the gun. My accomplice is going to commit the murder. So you, as the judges in this case, were we to have enough time, would be choosing one of these provided images. And they are randomized in the sense that none of my partners know which image, which image is which. I would study the face for a few minutes, again, skipping this since we're low on time, but that's what we did in the video. Um, and essentially what's happening here 
is we're crafting a story that I begin to associate with this image of my accomplice. Now, I'm in custody, and what is going to happen is I'm going to go through a trial where I see this face, which is the target, and the P300 classifier is going to compare my response to this image versus my response to all of these different images, find which one of these is the most similar to this, and that's how it knows who my accomplice is. So to just show you what the actual trial is going to look like, the 10 second countdown. <laughs> And so the user, Steven, is unfamiliar with all of these faces except for the one he pulled from the envelope. So that would be his guilty knowledge. So Maybe while we're tra or he's training, if we do have any remaining time, we can answer some questions. That would be awesome. His mo this model should be trained in about two minutes. So what is your accuracy rate? So with seven suspects, we achieved an accuracy of about 80%, and that's with two minutes of data collection. So two minutes of data collection, seven subjects, 80% accuracy. would love to take any other questions. We don't know how we're doing on time, unfortunately. Uh, what market do you see this fitting in? That's actually a great question because initially we really wanted to work on some sort of uh, actual lie detector that could work in the you know criminal justice system. Um, right now what we have is something more of a parlor trick and that's why we decided to gamify it in the context of Clue. So I think in this current paradigm, it's more of just an interesting um, EEG based game that you can use to uh, effectively read someone's mind and it doesn't necessarily have any applications outside of entertainment. But if we were to make the paradigm a bit more robust, it could be used in actual interrogation scenarios. Or a murder mystery party. Well, absolutely. Ooh. Do, do you see any uh, health? Would it be potentially for, you know, um, could you use it to, to train the brain for something? So the P300 is primarily an output related uh, system. I mean, we're not using it for feedback in any way. Um, the other uses of P300 have been medical in nature. So most famously is the P300 speller, which is uh, it allows people with tetraplegia and paralysis to control a keyboard by basically using a similar paradigm where they stare at keys on a keyboard, unable to move their hands to control that keyboard. And as images are flashed, they're able to determine that a P300 was flashed when the user when a uh, when a T was flashed. Therefore, the user was probably looking at a T, and that allows people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or multiple sclerosis or tetraplegia to be able to type with a keyboard, for example. Um, aside from that, we haven't explored any medical uses. All right, thank you. Thank you all so much. Yep. Oh, sorry. Everybody good? Thank you for thank your you. time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Welcome to Bravery. Bravery presents an innovative solution aimed at revolutionizing the treatment of specific phobias and PTSD through the integration of cutting edge VR technologies and comprehensive bio tracking. Specific phobias afflict nearly 10% of Canadian adults, rivaling the prevalence of age related hearing loss. In fact, the burden of anxiety disorders like phobias and PTSD collectively surpasses that of cancer. This highlights the pressing need for advancing interventions. Our framework, like all effective healthcare frameworks, puts the patient first. Utilizing customizable VR sims, Bravery harmonizes an extensive spectrum of biotracking data, such as heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, brain activity, and body movement. This aggregated data 
alongside a recording of each VR sim is then uploaded to our website where an algorithm applies validated formulas to synthesize it and present it in an easily digestible review. From here, patients can review their own data and customize the VR environment how they see fit. Additionally, this data can be shared with doctors who themselves can support patients and their unique needs. The comprehensive array of validated parameters we provide offers a tangible understanding of anxiety levels, which fosters personalized treatment approaches. To end, I wanna share a quote by Chris Milk, who says, if you look at the medium of VR, we are broadcasting human senses to your consciousness. We are duplicating perception. Welcome to Bravery, where science and technology converge to usher in a new era of precision medicine, transforming the treatment of anxiety disorders. Hi everyone. Today we are going to be presenting our, a live demo of our project, Bravery. We are going to first jump into the VR simulation. Welcome to our VR simulation. We start by spawning in the parking lot outside a doctor's office. For our demo, we've chosen to focus on treating iatrophobia, a fear of doctors and medical care. This fear can prevent timely access to healthcare and may lead to white coat syndrome, where being in a clinical setting raises blood pressure, potentially causing misdiagnosis. Now, let's walk into the waiting room. The system will record your current physiological measures, such as your heart rate, for analysis on our website dashboard. Feel free to interact with different objects in the room. We've designed a collision mechanic for a more immersive experience. We also decided to simulate a graded approach. We're exposing patients to a doctor's office. It's building furniture, devices, and environment without actual interaction with medical professionals or patients to help ease them into the therapy. Now, as we approach the doctor's office itself, we'd expect a patient with iatrophobia to experience an increase in heart rate. Here we are, entering the doctor's office. The patient's heart rate would likely be elevated at this point. You can interact with objects in the office, like the patient chair and bed, to increase familiarity with the medical setting. Throughout, we're monitoring your heart rate. Thank you for joining us in this VR simulation. Our approach aims to make exposure therapy more accessible and effective. Now, let's head into our website dashboard to see the data and progress. Welcome to the Bravery website. We custom built this site to directly integrate with our VR experience in real time. Let's check out the dashboard to see more. The dashboard is where the unique patient data lives. Patients and doctors have ready access to this portion of the website to guide care. On the sidebar, we can see a sessions tab where data and recordings from previous VR experiences exist. We have also on the side tab, we have a health tracker summarizing long-term data trends and a calendar where doctors and patients can schedule their next VR session. Below our patient identifiers, we have an easily digestible collection of physiological measures associated with anxiety for patients or clinicians to browse. As we scroll down, we can see an example of a chart that our website created from the real-time VR demonstration that we just saw. Charts like this, along with further data analysis for each physiological parameter, will be available for patients to review after each session. At the very bottom, we collect timestamps of each unique event that occurred during the SIM. This is helpful to guide patients in their understanding of which specific aspects of the SIM cause the greatest levels of anxiety. Lastly, we wanted to circle back and discuss the impact and commercial viability of bravery. As mentioned earlier, the disease burden of anxiety is enormous. In fact, it's greater than that of cancer. To illustrate this, anxiety disorders cost the Canadian healthcare system over $6.8 billion in 2022. When considering the enormity of a problem anxiety disorders such as phobias and PTSD present, the impact of that bravery is poised to make is profound, ushering in a new era of precision medicine for anxiety disorders. 
Thank you so much, and we would love to hear your questions. Thank you for presentation. Just wanted to, if you could clarify how you're measuring heart rate, blood pressure, and a few uh, of the other parameters. I can parameters. actually speak on that. Thanks. Right. So we actually measure heart rate using the Muse, which collects PPG data. And that actually is an LED that responds to changes in blood flow during the systole and the diastole. So essentially what happens is during the systole, when your blood is, when your heart is contracting, blood is being pushed out of your arteries and essentially you get increased amounts of blood flow. And that's actually detected by the LED. And this will actually be detected as peaks. So within the actual uh, graph that you get in the PPG, you can look at the different peaks and you can find the frequency of the peaks. And through that, you can calculate the heart rate. So I was noticing in your dashboard that there was a calendar function so that the user would uh, navigate the, the scenario with the clinician. Is that, is that correct? It wouldn't be like a self-navigation? Thank you for that question. The calendar function would allow both clinicians and patients to schedule in their own appointments. So yes, there's an avenue in which patients could totally self-schedule, and there's also an avenue in which patients could work with their doctors to schedule regular VR sessions. So both, really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my quick question, um, you mentioned about the costs for um, disorders, particularly with phobias, uh, some billion dollars. And then your last slide, the impact slide, talked about how there's an uh, impact of, uh, and bravery could be an answer. My question is, have you done any calculations, any projections on how bravery can be saving the system and how much can bravery be saving the system? Thank you. Yeah, another fantastic question. Although we didn't do any economical analysis about how much we feel this, project can save us or bravery could save. What I can say anecdotally, um, as a medical student who's been in a lot of doctor's offices, who's been with a lot of family doctors and psychiatrists, anecdotally, there is such a need for us to address anxiety in ways that don't involve direct pharmaceutical intervention. And I think bravery is poised to, or is at that perfect intersection of personalized medicine and treatment progression, where it can make such a big difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It is a tool that harnesses EEG waves for mood and speech communication, giving voices to individuals who have lost it, specifically using the open BCI ganglion headset. Take Davey, for example. He was diagnosed with ALS and gradually lost all motor function, including the ability to walk, speak, or make facial expressions. There are many disorders that impact motor neurons across the entire body, impairing speaking and motor control. A lot of patients report that they feel their identity and self-expression is hindered with diagnoses that impair their independence. This is where Neuroscribe can help. First, we utilize mood detection as a basis for text prediction and also as an indicator for the listener to convey tone. Then the user's imagined movements will be detected to allow users to perform word selection hands-free. Neuroscribe uses three main models. In general, we have EEG models for mood detection and imagined movements, and three categories of text prediction models. Mood detection was trained by testing users' reactions to images and categorizing them to negative, neutral, or positive. Each of these three moods corresponds to a specific language model which proposes words that better matches the user's emotional state. This makes sentence creation more seamless and efficient. Finally, our third model uses EEG waves to make selection of word choice hands-free. Users are told to imagine moving the word block up, down, left, or right to choose their selection. 
In general, Neuroscribe aims to help people like Davy to communicate and gain back their sense of identity and independence. This tool can be harnessed in daily communication, recreation, and clinical settings to improve individuals' quality of life. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Harrison, and with me is Rose, Elvin, Kevin, and Hillary, and we're the team behind Neuroscribe, a hands-free um, mood detection and text generation tool. Um, for our presentation, I'd like to do a live demonstration using the OpenBCI Ganglion headset and um, try to make some sentences uh, with, with Neuroscribe. So the first thing that I have on, on screen is a, a previously generated sentence, um, which was using brain signals. So um, it detected that I was in a negative mood, um, I guess stressed, um, and, and the sentence that I generated or that ended up being generated was only says has thing I say see, which isn't, um, you know, a super legible sentence. Um, but with with further training um, on the direction detection uh, algorithm with EEG data, we'll be able to have much more accurate sentences. So first thing, I will just refresh and we'll generate a new sentence live. So the first thing it does is using the um, EEG headset on my head, it detects the mood. Again, it detected negative. And what it does is at each time point, so every two seconds, it suggests the two most um, probable words that would come next in the sentence according to the language model associated with the mood. So um, I guess because I'm talking, it's still, still grabbing, uh, it's, it's taking actions. But at each time point, you have four actions up and down select the top and bottom words. Um, left refreshes the words and shows you the two, more, the two next most probable words. Um, sorry, I'm stuttering here on the screen with him, my, my, my. Um, and, and if you think about moving the block to the right, then you move on to the next word. So while our, uh, we have a lack of training data, um, so our, algor our machine learning algorithms aren't super accurate, um, I will demonstrate what, it, yeah, I'll just quickly demonstrate what it's like if you have more accurate, um, if you have more ac accurate responses using yeah. I just wanted to make a comment. The reason we initially just wanted to do EEG straight to text, but the literature and what EEG can do, we've noticed that imagined movements, they have pretty concrete brain areas associated with them, like the premotor cortex or the superior temporal sulcus area. So it's more concrete to use EEG as movement and selection tool rather than straight text to speech or EEG to speech, which is why we decided to go this route to make something that is possible and not just theoretical. Sorry, I've got shaky hands here. Touchpad is not great when you're nervous. Right there? Okay. okay, so what this does is it allows us to just use the, the keyboard to input instead of using the headset. It still uses the headset to detect the mood, however. So if I refresh, it'll detect the mood. And now it's using the neutral model. So at this point, it suggested two starting words, so it can use type or then. Um, we'll, we'll, I, I guess we'll, we'll see what we can get. So we'll start. Um, these aren't great starting words, so we're going to refresh them and try to get two more um, more useful words. Oh. So we'll do school. You tell me if there's a, there's a good one. School for... There's, there's a few, um, I guess, bugs that we, we will fix in the future um, with, if we had more time uh, to suggest, I guess, more relevant words, we would be able to train better language models. Um, school for a night. Difficult, difficult is a relevant word. <laughs> difficult life. And then we'll just end there. School for a night, weeks, difficult life. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so it does, it does take data from the EEG headset and it processes it and it feeds it into a machine learning model. The downside right now is just we do not have um, enough training data, but given enough time, we would be able to train data, improve that accuracy, um, and have more uh, correct uh, directions and decisions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I do have a question, and more of a procedural question, which is, for the demonstration, did you not just consider sort of limiting your sentences to subject, noun, you know, noun, verb, object kind of sentences to begin with? So they would sort of give you the right categories of, you know, I did that. Uh, so in the actual, in the earlier demo, it detected a negative mood and uh, when it does detect a negative or positive mood, the sentences do make a lot more sense because uh, it will reflect uh, positive and negative words such as, you know, happy, joy, uh, and then negative uh, sadness, you know, don't. Uh, words that make a lot more sense. Since it, this is using the neutral model, uh, it is bound to make less sense because uh, it's a combination of the positive and negative data t together. Uh, and also just the, the training was just far too limited. Um, you know, we only ran a uh, 10 epochs for each model, which is really not optimal. Uh, so if we did have more time, we, uh, we would have definitely trained the model a lot more and it would have uh, increased the accuracy a whole lot. And am I right in understanding that then the goal of having the model become trained is that it does sort of allow a person using it to communicate to, you know, better recognize their mood, better know the types of things that they want to say, better perhaps know the people that they might be talking about so that, yeah, okay, I see nods. That's Thank you. the nodes on the Life Pulse Guardian device are positioned as shown. Connect your Life Pulse Guardian device to the app, and once connected, hit Start. Here we can see that the user's real-time ECG data displayed on this graph. It appears that the user's health is currently in good condition. Let's find out what happens when we take database ECG data from a person with a heart condition and input it into the app. The database's data is processed by a machine learning model, which determines the user's heart health. An irregular heart status may indicate underlying conditions such as arrhythmia, or even an increased risk of a heart attack in the near future. From here, the user may call a specified primary contact, or, in emergency situations, the user has direct access to appropriate authorities. Life Pulse Guardian in its accessibility and convenient design that can comfortably be worn under clothes during daily life, has the potential to revolutionize heart condition detection as well as heart emergency response. Stay connected, stay protected with Life Pulse Guardian. Hello, everyone. Um, we're Control Out Defeat, and today we will be introducing Life Pulse Guardian. But first, what is Life Pulse Guardian? Inspiration. We are inspired by service dogs who are able to help their owners in emergency situations, uh, such as experiencing a heart attack. Next, we will be talking about how we created our project. So there are two main components to the project, one being the chest band, as you saw in the video. And this contains an ESP32, which is a microprocessor that has Bluetooth support, which connects to the EXG pill, which is a biopotential sensor, which can track your ECG data. As well as, it, um, as, well as we have the Android app component of the 
data which can uh, which does the processing and the machine learning models as well. Due to the inability to ethically uh, induce irregular heartbeat patterns, we use a publicly available database. With this database, we train a model to output binary classification, either normal or irregular heartbeat patterns. With our model, we get a resulting accuracy of 94%. Next, here are some reasons as to why you should choose our product. In terms of our competitors, there's a couple. There's the Holter monitor, uh, smartwatches, a respiratory belt, and even something called cardio, which is similar to our technology. However, they mainly focus on monitoring and diagnosis instead of emergency detection due to regulatory and liability issues. We aim, that's our main focus, the emergency part, and we aim to break that mold. All right, so why choose us over those competitors? Well, uh, first, uh, our use of ECG data over uh, PPGs, which is also common in uh, similar technologies, um, is superior for ensuring the technology of our model. Secondly, our device itself is built for daily 24-7 usage and is convenient enough to wear under clothes. Real-time data processing um, that within our mobile app and model prediction is ideal for this sort of emergency detection due to the swift uh, nature of the problem itself. Here are some possible developments that we could have had. Because the world of data is forever evolving, we would always want to keep our trained model up to date. In terms of improved design, since this is a prototype, we'd like to be able to design the band so that it's more accessible for others to wear um, of all different sizes. In regards to our app, we would like to be able to send notifications and alerts to either loved ones or people of their choice, as well as a designated contact list instead of having to manually type it all the time. All right, thank you so much for uh, watching our presentation. Just uh, really quickly though, I'd like to show you, you all um, our wearable device in the flesh, if that's okay. Um, oh, no, uh, Eden's giving a, a decline on that one. Sorry, folks, uh, maybe another time. Um, at least you can see that our, our app is, um, I'm actually wearing it right now under, underneath my clothes. Um, yeah, really delivering on the promise that, yeah, it, it is, able to be worn at all times. Anyway, um, just thought we'd let you know that it is indeed working. Any questions, please? Okay, thank you for that offer, but we'll imagine it. That's good. Um, uh, so yeah, I do have a question. So who do you envision this for? For just an average person? Do you people with a history of heart disease? Um, who's your target market? Oh, gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we do believe that this, um, that this device would be m most useful for users who have the possibility of experiencing a an emergency complication. Um, the 24-7 uh, availability of the device itself um, for, like, lends itself well to the ability to, to detect these um, complications at any time. So yes, definitely um, users with, oh, oh yeah, oh, well, I'll pass along to Kate here. Um, hi, so uh, from, I work at a senior's home and so they have, they still use pagers, just like the button on the wrist and often the residents forget to wear the pager or something happens and if something like that happens and they're not wearing the pager, if they're wearing this device, then it can send an alert to one of the managers or emergency services so that they can get help right away instead of waiting and exacerbating the problem. Hello? Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question. You mentioned that you use publicly available data, right? Uh, do you mind telling where did you collect the data from and how big was that data? Um, so it was an ECG data uh, collected, uh, ECG data heartbeats of arrhythmia patients. And how big was it? I mean, 
Uh, what is the number of attributes you have or in, in that data? There was uh, actually like a four separate data sets combined into one I found in the website. Mm -hmm. um, I saw there was like uh, over 40,000 rows. Over 40,000 rows. Yes. Okay, so pretty much big data. And you use the binary classification model, right? Yes. What type of classification? Um, so I converted the... Um, any of the rows that said normal, I changed that value to zero, and anything that's not normal, I changed it to one. No, I was asking in terms oh, of machine learning, what is the algorithm for classification? Oh, the algorithm. Well, we use um, no, fully connected neural uh, networks. Uh, logistic regression. Oh, logistic regression. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks. Um, my question is regarding, you mentioned about the senior's home, and that's one of the bigger things around any sort of these sort of wearable devices. Um, to keep them motivated or the data is, the device is as good as the data. So unless and until there's conformity, people would not be using it. So people who forget to wear a watch or a pager because it's so simple, what would be the way if you were to speak about this uh, product, like wearing it under your uh, clothes, it's more, more complex. How much do you see people actually conforming to it and continuing to use it, or after some time being like, oh no, this is more complex than just wearing a watch? So in terms of being at a senior's home, I believe that this product wouldn't be necessarily available to all of the residents. There would be priority residents that should be wearing these sorts of devices. Um, in terms of convincing them to wear it, or if they forget, then that would be a future development where we can integrate it with their clothes instead of a band so they don't think about wearing it. They just put on their clothes and then they go. Or most likely the patients that, uh, sorry, the residents that do have heart conditions, they probably have nurses that are assigned to them so those nurses as well can be trained to uh, remind them or make sure that the, those devices are attached. All right, that was quite exciting to see all those finalists. Um, I'm sure you are all eager to know who placed in the top and received the prizes. Uh, we'll be compiling that and uh, we'll be beginning the closing ceremonies shortly. <laughs> 